Senior Taliban leaders are having talks today with non-Taliban leaders on a way to try and include them in a new government. So what happens next? Jessica Stone is a journalist who spent close to a half year inside Afghanistan. She's also the host of Talking Politics and the Religion Podcast. Atia Atbari is a veteran foreign correspondent. She is in L.A. and BNC's Nayar Huck is still with us at the Pentagon. And uh, Atia, Atia, I'll begin with you. Um, based on what you've heard from the Pentagon this morning, the major concern seems to be getting people to the airport. Are you hearing anything from people on the ground that you are confident that they will be able to get to the airport and therefore get out of the country? Um, from everyone that I'm talking to on the ground right now, it's fairly impossible. Um, and by fairly, I mean completely impossible to get to the airport. Uh, there was one uh, journalist who worked for an American organization through his connections. He got an escort uh, from an embassy that recognizes the Taliban. But from the women I've spoken to, uh, they have prominent politicians have Taliban guards outside of their door to make sure that they can't leave. Um, when I asked this politician uh, if there was a way of sneaking out, she's like, well, I can try to make calls. I can try to find a way out. But even if I did, I'm so prominent that even if I made it to the airport, um, I would get attacked. Uh, there are too many people there. They know who I am. Uh, when I spoke to a female commando, uh, two sisters who are part of the Afghan Special Operations Forces, two sisters who were trained by the Americans, they're in hiding right now. Uh, they told me that their house has been raided. They were looking for them. Uh, they were luckily hiding in someone else's house. And she's been begging me, begging me to find a way to get her into Kaya, which is the military side of the airport where the American uh, military is at. And I've been making calls. I've been trying my best. Uh, we have people within the military who have been making calls. In fact, I was introduced to them by a U.S. service member who felt helpless in helping them. Uh, she's just desperate to get in. Jesse, you two have a family. Jessica, you two have a family that is inside Afghanistan trying to get out. What is the latest on their progress? And are they confident that they will be able to get from where they are? I believe they're in Kabul to the airport and therefore out of the country. Yeah, you know, I think it's important for your viewers to understand Kabul's a pretty big city. Uh, and so you can be uh, miles and miles away from the airport and dozens of checkpoints in between yourself. And so what Atia says is absolutely correct. Uh, the family that I'm in touch with is waiting, uh, is made sure it has enough food and water and uh, solar powered communications um, to, uh, to wait this out until a vehicle can be sent to escort them, just as the scenario that Atia laid out occurred for the journalist she mentioned. Um, that is the ideal situation. I have uh, been in touch with others who have uh, encouraged some to go to the airport, but the latest NATO gui guidance is that they should not. Um, it is, there is no facilities for people to wait. and. Um, I'm not sure what the latest is at the airport with respect to American control of all of the gates, but at one point they did not have control of all of the gates. And so uh, you had no assuredness of uh, even being let in or having a conversation with anybody if you got there. So it is clearly a chaotic scene. Um, we, are, we are really trying to get a personal escort secured vehicle to this family uh, to a private charter flight, a humanitarian flight at the airport. Nayara, the U.N. now calling on the Taliban to protect the civilian population under its control. Take a listen. We call on the international community to extend all possible support to those who may be at imminent risk. And we call on the Taliban to demonstrate through their actions, not just their words, that the fears for the safety of so many people in so many different walks of life are addressed. So... Nayer, this is the bottom line. After 20 years, $1 trillion, training 300,000 soldiers, the United States now finds itself at the mercy of the Taliban. How did the Pentagon try and spin that? Mm. Uh, they did not go into any details today about who was speaking at what level. They did say that there are no Guantanamo Bay detainees that are in, in command right now with the United States in terms of discussions. But we do know that Mullah Baradar, who was actually in jail in, in uh, Afghanistan, uh, is now 
in government and he is heading up the country. So we are literally in negotiating and working with uh, people who in previous administrations uh, were considered prisoners. And expand that broader, the broader picture here is that the Taliban has been waiting out the United States since the start of this mission. Usually when a diplomat or military leader says, do this or else, the or else is we will bomb your country and we will use military strength. When that is off the table, when in fact that's already been done and tried for 20 years, and then it gets taken off the table, all of these statements are simply that. They are statements of intent with zero ability to actually back them up. Atia, how long is the leash in this case? Um, how much time does the United States have to get people to the airport uh, in, in Kabul and get them out of the country? And, and how many soldiers can the United States keep sending back into country before the Taliban says enough is enough and we find ourselves right back into a conflict again? That is the ultimate question. The Taliban are completely unpredictable. Um, right now, they are putting on a show. Um, uh, many people hope, uh, particularly the men, that this is uh, what they will proceed with. But as Nair just pointed out, uh, what is the or else? Um, they have the upper hand right now. Uh, they are currently allowing the Americans to process people out. Uh, but for how long? That's going to be up to them. It's going to be up to them, really. And we don't we don't know. They are unpredictable. Uh, they were unpredictable in 1996. I, a little history reminder, when they came in in 1996, uh, they were welcomed in for stability, meaning no more fighting. The Civil War prior to that was the most barbaric time in Afghanistan's history. We talk about the Taliban, we talk about the Soviets, we talk about the last 20 years, but not many people know about that Civil War. So just as today, they came in in 1996 offering stability, offering peace, uh, and then from 1996 to 2001, we saw what happened. And right now, we're seeing them being interviewed on Afghan TV by female journalists. But how long is that going to last? None of us know. Right now, they're on the world stage, so they want to present a picture, uh, a positive picture for themselves. Uh, but once the world stage turns its eyes, once the media gets over, once there's another big story, uh, that's when I'm afraid uh, of what's going to happen. Jess, I, I brought this up in our last hour, but what happened to the phrase women and children first? If you look at those images of the people chasing that C-130 down the tarmac at the airport, they are mostly men. Uh, the men are back out on the streets. This is a country where the women are the ones who stand the most to lose. So should America first be trying to evacuate the women out of Afghanistan and then the men? Because if the Taliban moves in and takes control, which they have, it is the women who stand to lose the most, who have to wear the burqas, who have to go back to the sh strict Sharia law that, that Afghanistan has seen for so long. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. In fact, uh, my friend just told me that his wife just dug up her burqa from the 90s uh, that she was forced to wear and was glad that she still had it uh, so that she can cover herself. Um, the, the gains that women have had over the last 20 years uh, are significant and worth fighting for, uh, but they do stand the most to lose. Uh, and I think it's important to just shed a little bit of light on the process that, that many of these people are stuck in a bureaucratic process that prizes contractors uh, and uh, diplomats and people who have proof of their work for US government entities and the military. And many of those people are men. So a lot of the women that we're talking about are dependents, their wives and daughters and sisters of these people. Uh, and in many cases, we know from uh, John Kirby's briefing at the Pentagon yesterday that currently they have only been given to August 31st to complete this mission. And, uh, and that's not a heck of a lot of time to get tens of thousands of people out, even at the rate that Kirby said today during the briefing he could potentially see, actually I believe it was the the major general who gave that statement, but they're looking at somewhere between five and 8,000 people a day, which is incredibly, uh, incredibly optimistic given that they have uh, been able to get out 700 uh, just over the last two days. So um, yes, uh, women are, are absolutely the ones that stand to lose the, work, the, the most, which is what you saw at the briefing yesterday with the Afghan reporter 
uh, confronting the Pentagon spokesperson, John Kirby, directly about uh, the cost, the human cost here. Mayor, uh, final question, because we're going to have to go to break. But does the administration have enough time to really reverse what has been an S show? And that is putting it mildly. We did it with the Yazidis in Iraq when they were being evacuated from that mountaintop. But it's exactly what Jessica was saying and exactly what Atiyah was saying. They have to get these people out. Can they possibly reverse the nightmare that is now unfolding in Afghanistan? Afghanistan is effectively holding its breath to see what happens and unfolds in the next three to four weeks, uh, heading into this relatively arbitrary August 31st deadline. And that was something that John Kirby was pressed on today. And he said very clearly that the commander in chief has not authorized something beyond heading into September, even if things are secure and seem to be working. The commander in chief being President Biden would have to declare that this mission be extended and miss his deadlines. And that gets to the political will. The capability is absolutely there. The capabilities of the U.S. military certainly kept in the last seven or eight months as the transition was happening here in the United States, kept the Taliban at bay from taking over the capital and overtaking the country. So there is something to be said for U.S. military capabilities. It's the political will of the American public and the political leaders they have elected, let's not forget, two successive presidents uh, were elected under this banner of ending forever wars, ending the forgotten wars. And that is what Biden means when he says the buck stops with him. If you're wondering why the Taliban fears women, three names, Atiyah, Jessica, Nayera. Thanks for being with us.